Thank you for joining me on this adventure. Your presence means the world to me. Not finish high school, and he did not earn a high school equivalency until he was 20. He later studied law but was again unable to afford to finish his studies. In 1917, while working in a Manhattan law office, he volunteered for the U.S. Marine Corps and saw action in World War I, for which he was decorated with some of the highest honors the French Croix de Guerre, the American Distinguished Service Cross, and the U.S. Navy Cross. After the war he again worked in a law office before embarking on a financially successful business career. While working in business he began writing first short stories, then in 1933 a novel based on his war experiences, 1954, and then for film in 1956, 1985, and 2018. March was one of 12 inaugural inductees to the Alabama Writers Hall of Fame on June 8, 2015. With our foundation established, it's time to explore early life and its relevance to our overarching theme. William March was born William Edward Campbell. His father worked as a timber cruiser, estimating which stands of trees were big enough to warrant lumber companies investing in a sawmill in the area. He was the eldest son of eleven children, two of whom died in infancy and grew up in and around Mobile, Alabama. His father was an occasional heavy drinker who had a fondness for reciting poetry, especially Edda Allan Poe's at the dinner table. His mother, whose maiden name was Susan March, was probably better educated and taught the children to read and write. In the eyes of her family, she had married beneath herself. Neither parent seemed to have supported young March's literary efforts. He later stated he had composed a 10,000-line poem at the age of 12 but had burned the manuscript. Having eight other siblings, March was afforded no privileges, and by the time he was 14 the family moved to Lockhart, Alabama, preventing him from going to high school. Lockhart would later become the imaginary Hodgetown, Pearl County, in March's novels Come In at the Door 1934 and The Talons 1936. Instead, March received occasional schooling, probably in one room edifice then common in Sommel towns. He found employment in the office of a lumber mill. Two years later, March had returned to Mobile and found employment in a local law office. By 1913, he had saved enough money to take a high school course at Valparaiso University in Indiana, which allowed him to enroll at the University of Alabama to study law. He thrived as a student but could not afford the necessary tuition to complete his law degree. In the fall of 1916, he moved to New York. There he lived in a small boarding house in Brooklyn, found work as a clerk in the Manhattan law firm of Nevins, Brett and Kellogg, and attended plays. In this segment, we'll be unraveling the complexities of World War I and exploring its multifaceted nature. On June 5, 1917, March registered for military service. A little over a month after the U.S. entered World War I, he volunteered for the U.S. Marines on July 25, and after completing his training on Paris Island was shipped to France in February 1918. Along with two other future World War I literary figures, John W. Thomason and Lawrence Stallings, March embarked on USS Von Steuben at Philadelphia. He reached France in March 1918 and served as a sergeant in Co. F. 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, 4th Brigade of Marines, 2nd Division of the U.S. Army Expeditionary Force. March's company took part in every major engagement in which American troops were involved, incurring heavy casualties. As a member of the 5th Marines, March saw his first action on the Old Verdun battlefield near Les Epages and shortly afterwards at Below Wood, where he was wounded in the head and shoulder. He returned to the front in time for the offensive at the battles of Soissons and St. Mihiel. March was twice promoted and had attained the rank of sergeant when he was assigned to French troops in the Blanc Mont area on statistical duties. During the assault on Blankmont, which started on 3 October, March left a shelter to rescue wounded. The next day, during a counterattack, the enemy having advanced to within 300 meters of the first aid station, he immediately entered the engagement and the wounded refused to be evacuated until the Germans were thrown back. 
As a result of his actions, March received the French Croix de Guerre with Pomme and the Army Distinguished Service Cross for Valor. The Distinguished Service Cross is the second highest army decoration, next only to the Medal of Honor. A curious detail emerges from the account of his war experiences that would find its way into his fiction though it appears he was never gussed badly enough to be hospitalized for it. Upon his return from the war he told people that he was and that he only had a short time to live. A number of characters in Company Kelvin suffer and die after mustard gas attacks. Roy Simmons, March's biographer, locates the origin of what he calls the two worlds of William March, the title of his biography in this period. Throughout his life, March appears to have mixed reality with imagined memory telling supposedly historical anecdotes that may not have been true. An experience March told a number of times included his jumping into a bomb crater to take shelter and coming face to face with a young German soldier, whom he instantly bayoneted. This anecdote also found its way into Company K. Let's now shift gears and explore official citations through a critical lens, uncovering its strengths and weaknesses. The official citation to the Croix de Guerre reads as follows. The citation for March's distinguished service cross under his birth name William East. Campbell reads as follows. When the Navy Cross, the United States Navy's second highest award for valor after the Medal of Honor, was established in 1919, March received that award as well 326 Marines who had previously received the Army Distinguished Service Cross in World War I would receive the Navy Cross for the same action. March's citation for the Navy Cross reads similar to that for the Army Distinguished Service Cross. Now, let's shift our perspective and explore literary aftermath of World War through a fresh lens, unlocking new perspectives. In 1919, March returned to civilian life but experienced bouts of anxiety and depression. The aforementioned experience of having bayoneted a young, blonde German soldier is recounted in Company Kelvin and is there attributed to Private Manuel Burt. March suffered hysterical attacks at different moments in his life related to the throat and the eyes. He rarely spoke of his own war experiences or awards, though people noted that he was in the habit of always taking his medals with him, and on occasion he told war stories. March stayed for a few weeks with his family in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, then found work at a law firm in Mobile. Soon, however, he became the personal secretary of John B. Waterman, of whose newly founded and quickly growing shipping company, the Waterman Steamship Corporation, he eventually became vice president. In 1924, he was promoted to traffic manager. In 1926, the company opened an office in Memphis, Tennessee, which much supervised. He spent two years in Memphis and became involved in the local theater scene. All the while, he traveled the country on business trips, often accompanied by his friend and business associate J.P. Case. This associate recalls that March's rooms were usually littered with papers and books, many of them on psychology. March was reading Alfred Adler, Sigmund Freud, and Carl Jung intensively. In 1928, March moved again to New York, where he took creative writing classes at Columbia University and began writing short stories. March settled on his nom de plume after sending out a number of different stories under different pseudonyms. The one that got published first decided his literary name. A Holy Wreath was his first publication. It appeared under the name of William March in the Forum, a literary magazine from New York, in September 1929. The Forum would publish more of his stories, as did Contempo, a review of books and personalities, Prairie Schooner, and other literary magazines. His stories were included in two annual anthologies of short fiction, Edward O'Brien's The Best American Short Stories and the O. Henry Prize Stories, in 1930, 1931, and 1932. In all, he published some 20 stories, four of them were vignettes that were to be included in his first novel. March finished his first novel, Company K, while living in New York. It was published in January 1933 by Harrison Smith and Robert Hoss. Encompassing much of his wartime experience, it was an instant success and went through three printings. 
By this time, March was already living in Hamburg, Germany. He was now Waterman's senior traffic manager and was sent to Germany to help open up the European market. In Hamburg, he finished his second novel, Come In At The Door, his first novel of the Pearl County series of novels and short stories set in the mythical towns of Hodgetown, Bay City, and Riedeville. Also in Hamburg, he witnessed the rise of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi regime and wrote a prophetic short story, Personal Letter, which expressed anxiety over the political future of Germany and the world. March was fearful of publishing the story, as he was already well established as an anti-militarist author and was afraid to place his German friends and associates in undue peril. It was later published in Trial Balance, the collected short stories of William March. Two years later, following a move to London, March finished his third novel, The Talons, the second in his Pearl County series. Reviews in the UK were generally positive, more so than in the United States. Psychological problems that had already bothered him in Germany worsened in London, and he became a patient of psychoanalyst Edward Glover, who was able to cure March's throat paralysis, diagnosing it as a hysterical condition. March dedicated The Talons to him as a slight recompense for the grey hairs I have put in his head. While in London March became acquainted with a number of literary characters, leaving more of his waterman work to his subordinates. In 1937, he returned to the US and within two years resigned his position to concentrate more on his writing, which by then was a full-time occupation. He had been paid partly in stock and could live well off the dividends. 1937, Simmons Notes, was an important year. It marked the high point of his productivity as a short story writer, and the magazine The American Mercury took up company Kelvin for a reprinting. In 1943, he completed his most ambitious and critically acclaimed novel, The Looking Glass, the final book in his Pearl County series. Bert Hitchcock, literature professor at Auburn, called it March's finest literary achievement. The spotlight now falls on later years as we delve deeper into its details. Harcourt published a March collection, Trial Balance, the collected short stories of William March, in 1945, and according to Marjorie Farber, in the Kenyan Review, the stories pack big ideas elaborately in tiny anecdotal satires. March, she says, is the dramatist of ideas, titles, puns a comedian's comedian, bearing perhaps the same relation to fiction as Stevens bears to poetry. But all the same it's astonishing what variety of quiet desperation and low misery and high comedy he manages to encompass in this book. Let's skip his defects, shall we? I haven't nearly room enough for all his virtues. This critical acclaim notwithstanding, in 1947, after years of depression from his experiences in the war and a continuing bout of writer's block, March suffered a nervous breakdown. He briefly returned to Mobile to recuperate and made many return visits to New York to settle his affairs. On one such visit in 1949, March happened upon the gallery of New York art dealer Klaus Pearls, which proved to be a turning point in March's life. Pearls, accustomed to dealing with creative personalities, accepted March in a way March had not experienced since his days of therapy in London. Through Pearls, March was able to talk openly about his creative process, using Pearls as a sounding board for his ideas. Pearls also introduced March to a world of other artists. In the works of Pablo Picasso and particularly those of Chom Satin, March found a kinship and connection as March and Satin both displayed paranoid and schizophrenic tendencies. Much returned Pearl's friendship with a steady acquisition of works by Satin, Joseph Glosco, Picasso, and Georges Rault. He continued this friendship with routine visits to New York between 1949 and 1953 until ailing health prevented him from further travels. In late 1950, March permanently left Mobile and purchased a Creole cottage on Domain Street in the French Quarter of New Orleans. It was here that he composed his last two novels, October Island 1952 and The Bad Seed 1954. 
Much viewed the latter novel as a media accomplishment, but it gained the most praise and success of any of his novels, selling more than a million copies in one year, launching a long-running Broadway hit penned by the Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright Maxwell Anderson and an eponymous 1956 movie directed by Mervyn Leroy. Without wasting any more time, let's jump into the fascinating world of death. On March 25, 1954, March suffered a mild heart attack and was still recovering when The Bad Seed was published on April 8. He was able to read many of the book's positive reviews. He was discharged from the hospital on April 24, but after only three weeks, on the night of May 15, 1954, he died in his sleep of a second and more severe heart attack, at age 60. On the morning of March's death, the following paragraph was discovered in his typewriter. Entitled Poor Pilgrim, Poor Stranger, it was presumably written after his discharge from the hospital. His biographer Simmons surmises it might have been from a book March was working on, and reads, March is buried in Evergreen Cemetery in Tuscaloosa, Alabama along with his parents, John Leonard Campbell and Susan March Campbell. The inscription on his tombstone reads, As we enter this new chapter, let's navigate the complexities of literary's complete body of work. British-American journalist and broadcaster Alistair Cook wrote that March was the most underrated of all contemporary American writers of fiction, citing the author's unique style as classic modern and stating that March was the unrecognized genius of our time. Cook himself championed the anthology of William March Omnibus, which was published two years after March died. In 2009, only The Bad Seed and Company Kelvin were still in print. In 2015, the University of Alabama Press returned to print the three novels in the Pearl County series, Come In At The Door, The Talons, and The Looking Glass. In this section, we'll be shedding light on Company K and its impact on our understanding of the subject. Company K, published in 1933, was hailed as a masterpiece by critics and writers alike and has often been compared to Eric Maria Remarque's classic anti-war novel All Quiet on the Western Front for its hopeless view of war. University of Alabama professor of American literature and author Philip Beidler wrote, in his introduction to a republication of the book in 1989, that March's act of writing Company K, in effect reliving his very painful memories, was itself an act of tremendous courage, equal to or greater than whatever it was that earned him the distinguished service cross, Navy cross and French Croix de Guerre. Contemporary critics praised the powerful effect of March's novel technique of multiple points of view. Already in 1935 in an essay on new techniques in the novel, John Frederick wrote in the English journal, The cumulative effect is one of the most powerful and memorable to be found in the whole range of writing about the war. In 2004, Alabama filmmaker Robert Clem made a feature adaptation of the novel. The movie attracted local interest. The novel has garnered attention as a World War I classic in other languages also. In 1967 it was translated into Italian for editor Longan C.S. Furuko. Fire. And in 2008, it was translated into Dutch and published in a series called The Library of the First World War. Now, let's shift our focus to the bad seed and embark on an intellectual exploration of its various dimensions. The Bad Seed, published in April 1954, was a critical and commercial success, and introduced Rory Penmark, an eight-year-old sociopath and burgeoning serial killer. The novel became an instant bestseller and was widely praised by critics for its use of suspense and horror. James Kelly writes, for the New York Times book review, The Bad Seed scores a direct hit, either as exposition of a problem or as a work of art. Venturing a prediction and a glance over the shoulder, no more satisfactory novel will be written in 1954 or has turned up in recent memory. Although March lived long enough to see the critical praise bestowed upon the novel and hear of its commercial success, he died before the novel's full impact became apparent. It went on to sell more than a million copies, was nominated for the 1955 National Book Award, adapted into a successful and long-running Broadway play by Maxwell Anderson, 
and was adapted for film three times. In 1956 directed by Mervyn Leroy, in 1985 directed by Paul Winkus, and in 2018 directed by and starring Rob Lowe. Turning our focus to short prose, let's explore its key elements. March was an accomplished short story writer and published four collections of stories. The Filipino poet and critic Jose Garcavilla regarded March as the greatest short story writer America has produced. He won for O. Henry Awards for his short stories, tied for the most wins by any author up until that time. Trial Balance The collected short stories of William March collects many of March's short stories from his entire career. The book was published in 1987 by the University of Alabama Press, with an introduction by Rosemary Canfield Reisman. None of March's story collections is currently in print. A Little Book with a March Story, The First Sunset, was printed in a limited edition of 150 copies by Cincinnati printer and writer Robert Laurie's Little Man Press. Brace yourself for a deep dive into 99 fables as we explore its impact and relevance in our evolving narrative. Six years after March's death, his 99 fables were published by the University of Alabama Press. March's fables follow those of Aesop, according to a review in the New York Times book review, Mr. March has picked up where Aesop and Don Marquis left off. Alan King, however, reviewing the book for the South Atlantic Bulletin, said the fables are platitudinous and offer no new insights into the nature of man. The cover won an award at the 1960 Southern Books competition, the book is not currently in print. Welcome to the next segment, where we explore the two worlds of William March and its significance in our journey. Of paramount importance to scholars is Roy South. Simmons's 1984 definitive biography of March, The Two Worlds of William March. Simmons continued the work of his friend Lawrence William Jones, who had been working on a March biography but died in a car accident. Simmons had only a passing knowledge of March's writing but became increasingly interested in finishing Jones' work after having read through many of the papers that Jones had left behind, notably the 43-page memoir Bill March by New Orleans journalist Clint Bolton. Although March had intimated that he wished for no biography to be written, the Campbell family, after having read the completed manuscript, gave their approval, though grudgingly, it seems. The biography received positive reviews, with one reviewer calling it a critical study that is a judicious record of March's life and a fine tribute to his literary achievement, and closes on a note of praise. Complementing the biography, Simmons also published William March, an annotated checklist, an annotated bibliography of primary and secondary documents pertaining to March's life and work. Now, let's redirect our focus towards William Mark and Panique and discover its significance in our narrative. Robert Clem's documentary film on March, entitled William Mark and Panique Kelvin 2004, includes excerpts from Clem's feature adaptation of Company Kelvin and focuses on the effects of March's painful war experience on his later life. The documentary was shown at Birmingham. Alabama's Sidewalk Moving Picture Festival and Ed on PBS in 2004. As we enter this new chapter, let's navigate the complexities of military awards and unravel its multifaceted nature. French Croix de Guerre with Pomme, 1918 U.S. Distinguished Service Cross, 1918 U.S. Navy Cross, 1918. In the upcoming portion, We'll be dissecting literary awards to gain a comprehensive understanding of its implications. The Little Wife included in the Best American Short Stories and O. Henry Prize Stories, 1930 from Company K included in O. Henry Prize Stories, 1931 A Sum in Addition included in O. Henry Prize Stories, 1936 Maybe the Sun Will Shine included in the Best American Short Stories, 1937 The Last Meeting included in O. Henry Prize Stories, 1937 The Female of the Fruit Fly included in the Best American Short Stories, 1944 The Bad Sea National Book Award nomination, 1955. In this chapter, we'll be shedding light on novels and its role in shaping our understanding. Republished, Inch. John W. Aldridge. 
Republished Edition and Int. Philip Bideler, Republished Int. Elaine Scholter, Republished Int. Elaine Scholter. Turning our focus to collections, let's explore its key elements. 1970 Republication. 1987 Republication. In the upcoming section, we'll be shining a light on films based on March's works. The Bad Seed directed by Mervyn Leroy, 1956. The Bad Seed directed by Paul Winkus, 1985. Company Kelvin directed by Robert Clem, 2004. The Bad Seed directed by Rob Lowe, 2018. Stay connected and join our community by subscribing and following me on other platforms.